Ah, Are You Digging on My Grave by Thomas Hardy, read for LibriVox.org by Stafford Wood. Ah, are you digging on my grave, my loved one planting rue? No, yesterday he went to wed, one of the brightest wealth has bred. It cannot hurt her now, he said, that I should not be true. Then who is digging on my grave, my nearest, dearest kin? Ah, no, they sit and think what use, what good will planting flowers produce? No tendance of her mound can loose her spirit from death's gin. But someone digs upon my grave, my enemy, prodding sly. Nay, when she heard you'd pass the gate that shuts on all flesh soon or late, she thought you no more worth her aid, and cares not where you lie. Then who is digging on my grave? Say, since I have not guessed. Oh, it is I, my mistress dear, your little dog who still lives near, and much I hope my movements here have not disturbed your rest. Ah, yes, you dig upon my grave. Why flashed it not to me that one true heart was left behind? What feeling do we ever find to equal among humankind a dog's fidelity? Mistress, I dug upon your grave to bury a bone, in case I should be hungry near the spot when passing on my daily trot. I am sorry, but I quite forgot it was your resting place. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Antigonish by William Hughes Mearns Read for LibriVox.org by Dale Grothman Yesterday, upon the stair, I met a man who wasn't there. He wasn't there again today. Oh, how I wish he'd go away. When I came home last night at three, the man was waiting there for me. But when I looked around the hall, I couldn't see him there at all. Go away. Go away. Don't you come back any more. Go away, go away, please don't slam the door. Last night I saw upon the stair a little man who wasn't there. He wasn't there again today. Oh, how I wish he'd go away. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Apparitions by Robert Browning Read for LibriVox.org by Roger Smith Apparitions Such a star bank of moss Till that May morn Blue ran the flash across Violets were born Sky What a scowl of cloud Till near and far Ray on ray split the shroud Splendid a star World How it wild about life with disgrace till god's own smile came out that was thy face end of recording this recording is in the public domain ascension by leland s copeland read for LibriVox.org by dale grothman age by age the sun is rising toward the apex of its way seeking heights where vega sparkles many trillion miles away so the soul of man is climbing wistful ever mortals wind further from the brute and caveman dawn and morning of the mind into dust fall kings and idols superstition ancient gear for the strength of thought is stronger than the curb of hope or fear 
man is breaking vain traditions old injustice legal wrong giving outworn good for better while he thinks and toils along quelling plagues controlling nature losing zest for martial fame winning on this little planet glory for the human name smiling upward sweeping onward through the night and through the day mounts the soul of man still higher toward the apex of its way end of poem this recording is in the public domain a ballad of riding by hugh mcculloch read for LibriVox.org by newgate novelist oh for a horse on a summer night when the moon is full and the winds at play laugh aloud in their free delight and have no will to stop nor stay and on rush we away away under the forest boughs so fleet that we stir the leaves to dance and play and the whole world echoes with galloping feet through forest glades where the air is bright and moonlit branches glisten and sway and on through the midst of the forest's might where moonlight and shadow join tremulous fray through darker aisles where never a ray of moon or star can find retreat and the darkness opens to give us way and the whole world echoes with galloping feet hurrying on in our headlong flight we speed till we come in the night's decay to the river whose ripples left and right murmur us up to the edges stray along the banks our course we lay and eastward speed the dawn to greet while the moon looks down so sad and grey and the whole world echoes with galloping feet friend is there any joy which may compare with this when the pulses beat when life is young and the heart is gay and the whole world echoes with galloping feet end of poem this recording is in the public domain Forty-five, Before the Ice is in the Pools, by Emily Dickinson, read for LibriVox.org, by Winston Tharp. Before the ice is in the pools, before the skaters go, or any cheek at nightfall is tarnished by the snow, before the fields have finished, before the Christmas tree, wonder upon wonder will arrive to me. What we touch the hems of on a summer's day, What is only walking just a bridge away, That which sings so, speaks so, When there's no one here, Will the frock I wept in Answer me to wear? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To the Child Jesus by Henry Van Dyke Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. 1. The Nativity Could every time-worn heart but see thee once again, A happy human child among the homes of men, The age of doubt would pass, The vision of thy face would silently restore The childhood of the race. 2. The Flight into Egypt thou wayfaring jesus a pilgrim and stranger exiled from heaven by love at thy birth exiled again from thy rest in the manger a fugitive child mid the perils of earth cheer with thy fellowship all who are weary wandering far from the land that they love guide every heart that is homeless and dreary safe to its home in thy presence above end of poem this recording is in the public domain. Chillon by George Gordon Lord Byron Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachok Eternal spirit of the chainless mind, Brightest in dungeons, liberty thou art, 
for there thy habitation is the heart the heart which love of thee alone can bind and when thy sons to fetters are consigned to fetters and the damp vault's rayless gloom their country conquers with their martyrdom and freedom's fame finds wings on every wind Chillon, thy prison is a holy place and thy sad floor an altar for twas trod until his very steps have left a trace worn as if thy cold pavement were a sod by bonnevar may none those marks efface for they appeal from tyranny to god end of poem this recording is in the public domain Christopher Marlowe by Algernon Charles Swinburne Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone Crowned, girdled, garbed and shod with lights and fire, Sun firstborn of the morning, sovereign star, Soul nearest ours of all that were most far most far off in the abysm of time thy lyre hung highest above the dawn enkindled choir where all ye sang together all that are and all the starry songs behind thy car rang sequence all our souls acclaim thee sire if all the pens that ever poets held had fed the feeling of their master's thoughts and as with rush of hurtling chariots the flight of all their spirits were impelled towards one great end thy glory nay not then not yet mightst thou be praised enough of men end of poem this recording is in the public domain. Fair Star of Evening by William Wordsworth Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk Fair Star of Evening, Splendor of the West, Star of my Country, on the horizon's brink thou hangest stooping as might seem to sink on england's bosom yet well pleased to rest meanwhile and be to her a glorious crest conspicuous to the nations thou i think shouldst be my country's emblem and shouldst wink bright star with laughter on her banners dressed in thy fresh beauty there that dusky spot beneath thee it is england there it lies blessings be on you both one hope one lot one life one glory i with many a fear for my dear country many heartfelt sighs among men who do not love her linger here end of poem this recording is in the public domain. Goblin Market by Christina Rossetti Read for LibraryVox.org by Jenna Oklani Morning and evening maids heard the goblins cry, Come, buy our orchard fruits. Come buy, come buy. Apples and quinces, lemons and oranges, plump, unpucked cherries. Melons and raspberries, bloom down cheeked peaches, swart headed mulberries, wild free born cranberries, crab apples, dewberries, pineapples, blackberries, apricots, strawberries, all ripe together in summer weather, morns that pass by, fair eves that fly. Come by, come by. Our grapes fresh from the vine, pomegranates full and fine, dates and sharp bullaces, rare pears and green gauges, damsons and bilberries, taste them and try currants and gooseberries bright fire like barberries figs to fill your mouth citrons from the south sweet to tongue and sound to eye come by come by evening by evening among the brookside rushes laura bowed her head to hear lizzie veiled her blushes 
crouching close together in the cooling weather, with clasping arms and cautioning lips, with tingling cheeks and fingertips. Lie close, Laura said, pricking up her golden head. We must not look at goblin men, we must not buy their fruits. Who knows upon what soil they fed their hungry, thirsty roots? Come by, called the goblins, hobbling down the glen. Oh, cried Lizzie, Laura, Laura, you should not peep at goblin men. Lizzie covered up her eyes, covered close lest they should look. Laura reared her glossy head and whispered like the restless brook. Look, Lizzie, look, Lizzie. Down the glen tramp little men. One holds a basket, one bears a plate, one lugs a golden dish of many pounds weight. How fair the vine must grow, whose grapes are so luscious. How warm the wind must blow through those fruit bushes. No, said Lizzie, no, no, no. Their office should not charm us. Their evil gifts would harm us. She thrust a dimpled finger in each ear, shut eyes and ran. Curious, Laura chose to linger, wandering at each merchant man. One had a cat's face, one whisked a tail, one tramped at a rat's pace, one crawled like a snail. One like a wombat prowled, obtuse and furry. One like a rattle tumbled, hurry scurry. She heard a voice like voice of doves cooing all together. They sounded kind and full of loves in the pleasant weather. Laura stretched her gleaming neck like a rush-embedded swan, like a lily from the beck, like a moonlit poplar branch, like a vessel at the launch when its last restraint is gone. Backwards up the mossy glen turned and trooped the goblin men, with their shrill repeated cry, Come by, come by! When they reached where Laura was, they stood stock still upon the moss, leering at each other, brother with queer brother, signaling each other, brother with sly brother. One set his basket down, one reared his plate, one began to weave a crown of tendrils, leaves, and rough knots brown. Men sell not such in any town. One heaved the golden weight of dish and fruit to offer her. Come by, come by, was still their cry. Laura stared but did not stir, longed but had no money. The whisk-tailed merchant bade her taste in tones as smooth as honey. The cat-faced purred, the rat-faced spoke a word of welcome, and the snail-paced even was heard. One parrot-voiced and jolly cried, Pretty goblin still for pretty Polly. One whistled like a bird. But sweet-tooth Laura spoke in haste, Good folk, I have no coin, to take were to purloin. I have no copper in my purse, I have no silver either, and all my gold is on the first that shakes in windy weather above the rusty heather. You have much gold upon your head, they answered altogether. Buy from us with a golden curl. She clipped a precious golden lock. She dropped a tear more rare than pearl. Then sucked their fruit globes fairer red, sweeter than honey from the rock, stronger than man rejoicing wine, clearer than water flowed that juice. She never tasted such before. How should it cloy with a length of use? She sucked and sucked and sucked the more fruits which that unknown orchid bore. She sucked until her lips were sore, then flung the emptied rides away, but gathered up one kernel stone and knew not was it night or day as she turned home alone. Lizzie met her at the gate, full of wise upbraidings. Dear, you should not stay so late. Twilight is not good for maidens. Should not loiter in the glen in the haunts of goblin men. Do you not remember Jeanie, how she met them in the moonlight? Took their gifts both choice and many, ate their fruits and wore their flowers, plucked from bowers where summer ripens at all hours. But ever in the moonlight she pined and pined away sought them by night and day, found them no more but dwindled and grew gray, then fell with the first snow, while to this day no grass will grow, where she lies low. I planted daisies there a year ago that never blow. You should not loiter so. Nay, hush, said Laura. Nay, hush, my sister. I ate and ate my fill, yet my mouth water still. Tomorrow night I will buy more, and kissed her. Have done with sorrow. I'll bring you plums tomorrow, fresh on their mother's twigs, Cherries worth getting. You cannot think what figs my teeth have met in, what melons icy cold piled on a dish of gold too huge for me to hold, what peaches with a velvet nap, pellucid grapes without one seed. Odorous indeed must be the mead, whereon they grow and pure the wave they drink, with lilies at the brink and sugar sweet their sap. Golden head by golden head, like two pigeons in one nest, folded in each other's wings, they lay down in their curtained bed like two blossoms on one stem like two flakes of new-fallen snow, like two wands of ivory tipped with gold for awful kings. Moon and stars gazed in at them, wind sang to them lullaby, lumbering owls forbore to fly, not a bat flapped to and fro round their rest, cheek to cheek and breast to breast locked together in one nest. Early in the morning when the first cock crowed his warning, 
neat like bees as sweet as busy. Laura rose with Lizzie, fetched in honey, milked the cows, aired and set to rights the house, kneaded cakes of whitest wheat, cakes for dainty mouths to eat, next churned butter, whipped up cream, fed their poultry, sat and sewed, talked as modest maidens should, Lizzie with an open heart, Laura in an absent dream, one content, one sick in part, one warbling for the mere bright day's delight, one longing for the night. At length slow evening came. They went with pitchers to the reedy brook. Lizzie most placid in her look, Laura most like a leaping flame. They drew the gurgling water from its deep. Lizzie plucked purple and rich golden flags. Then turning homeward said, The sunset flushes those furthest loftiest crags. Come, Laura, not another maiden lags. No willful squirrel wags. The beasts and birds are fast asleep. But Laura loitered still among the rushes, and said the bank was steep and said the hour was early still, the dew not fallen, the wind not chill, listening ever but not catching the customary cry, come by, come by, with its iterated jingle of sugar-baited words, not for all her watching once discerning even one goblin, racing, whisking, tumbling, hobbling, let alone the herds that used to trample along the glen, in groups or single of brisk fruit merchant men, till lizzie urged oh laura come i hear the fruit call but dare not look you should not loiter longer at this brook come with me home the stars rise the moons bend her arc each glowworm winks her spark let us get home before the night grows dark for clouds may gather though this is summer weather put out the lights and drench us through then if we lost our way what should we do Laura turned cold as stone to find her sister heard that cry alone, that goblin cry, Come by our fruits, come by. Must she then buy no more such dainty fruit? Must she no more succus pasture find, gone deaf and blind? Her tree of life drooped from the root. She said not word in her heart's sore ache, but peering through the dimness, not discerning, trudged home her pitcher dripping all the way. So crept to bed and lay silent till Lizzie slept then sat up in a passionate yearning, and gnashed her teeth for bulk desire, and wept as if her heart would break. Day after day, night after night, Laura kept watch in vain, in sullen silence of exceeding pain. She never caught again the goblin cry, Come by, come by. She never spied the goblin men, hawking their fruits along the glen. But when the noon waxed bright, her hair grew thin and gray, she dwindled as the fair full moon doth turn to swift decay and burn her fire away. One day, remembering her colonel stone, she set it by a wall that faced the south. Dewed it with tears, hoped for a root, watched for a waxing shoot. But there came none. It never saw the sun. It never felt the trickling moisture run. While with sunk eyes and faded mouth she dreamed of melons as a traveller sees false waves in a desert drouth with shade of leaf-crowned trees and burns the thirstier in the sandful breeze. She no more swept the house, tended the foals or cows, fetched honey, kneaded cakes of wheat, brought water from the brook, but sat down listless in the chimney nook and would not eat. Tender Lizzie could not bear to watch her sister's cankerous care, yet not to share, she night and morning caught the goblin's cry, Come by our orchard fruits, come by, come by. Beside the brook, along the glen, she heard the tramp of goblin men, the yoke and stir. Poor Laura could not hear, longed to buy fruit to comfort her, but feared to pay too dear. She thought of Jeanie in her grave, who should have been a bride, but who for joy bride's hope to have fell sick and died in her gay prime. In earliest winter time, with the first glazing rhyme, with the first snowfall of crisp winter time, Till Laura dwindling seemed knocking at death's door, then Lizzie weighed no more, better and worse, but put a silver penny in her purse, kissed Laura across the heath with clumps of furs at twilight, halted by the brook, and for the first time in her life began to listen and look, laughed every goblin when they spied her peeping, came towards her hobbling, flying, running, leaping, puffing and blowing, chuckling, clapping, crowing, clucking and gobbling, mopping and mowing, full of airs and graces, pulling wry faces, demure grimaces, cat-like and rat-like, rattle and wombat-like, snail-paced in a hurry, parrot-voiced and whistler. Helter-skelter, hurry-scurry, chattering like magpipes, fluttering like pigeons, gliding like fishes, hugged her and kissed her, squeezed and caressed her, stretched up their dishes, paneers, and plates. Look at our apples, russet and dun, bob at our cherries, bite at our peaches, citrons and dates, grapes for the asking, pears red with baskings out in the sun. Plums on their twigs, pluck them and suck them, pomegranates, figs. Good folks, said Lizzie, mindful of Jeanie. Give me much and many, held out her apron. 
tossed them her penny. Nay, take a seat with us, honor and eat with us, they answered, grinning. Our feast is but beginning. Night yet is early, warm and dew and pearly. Wakeful and starry, such fruits as these no man can carry. Half their bloom would fly, half their dew would dry, half their flavor would pass by. Sit down and feast with us. Be welcome, guest with us. Cheer you and rest with us. Thank you, said Lizzie, but one waits at home alone for me, so without further parleying, if you will not sell me any of your fruits, though much and many, give me back my silver penny. I tossed you for a fee. They began to scratch their pates, no longer wagging, purring, but visibly demurring. Grunting and snarling, one called her proud, cross-grained, uncivil, their tones waxed loud, their looks were evil, lashing their tails, they trod and hustled her, elbowed and jostled her, clawed with their nails, barking, mewing, hissing, mocking, tore her gown and soiled her stocking, twitched her hair out by the roots, stamped upon her tender feet, held her hands and squeezed their fruits against her mouth to make her eat. White and golden Lizzie stood like a lily in a flood, like a rock of blue-veined stone lashed by tides obstreperously, like a beacon left alone in a hoary, roary sea, sending up a golden fire, like a fruit-crowned orange tree, white with blossoms honey-sweet, sore beset by wasp and bee, like a royal virgin town topped with gilded dome and spire, close beleaguered by a fleet mad to dug her standard down. One may lead a horse to water, twenty cannot make him drink, though the goblins cuffed and caught her, coaxed and fought her, bullied and besought her, scratched her, pinched her black as ink, kicked and knocked her, mauled and mocked her. Lizzie uttered not a word, would not open lip from lip, lest they should cram a mouthful in, but laughed in heart to feel the drip of juice that syruped all her face, and lodged in dimples of her chin, and streaked her neck which quaked like curd. At last the evil people, worn out by her resistance, flung back her penny, kicked their fruit along whenever road they took, not leaving root or stone or shoot. Some writhed into the ground, some dived into the brook, with ring and ripple, some scuttled on the gale without a sound, some vanished in the distance. In a smart ache tingle, Lizzie went her way, knew not was it night or day, sprang up the bank, tore through the fuzz, threaded corpse and dingle, and heard her penny jingle, bouncing in her purse. Its bounce was music to her ears. She ran and ran as if she feared some goblin man dogged her with gibe or curse or something worse. But not one goblin scurried after, nor was she pricked by fear. The kind heart made her windy paste that urged her home quite out of breath with haste and inward laughter. She cried, Laura, up the garden, did you miss me? Come and kiss me. Never mind my bruises. Hug me, kiss me, suck my juices, squeeze from goblin fruits for you. Goblin pulp and goblin dew. Eat me, drink me, love me. Laura, make much of me. For your sake I have braved the glen and had to do with goblin merchant men. Laura started from her chair, flung her arms up in the air, clutched her hair. Lizzie, Lizzie, have you tasted for my sake the fruit forbidden? Must your light like mine be hidden, your young life like mine be wasted? Undone in mine undoing, and ruined in my ruin? Thirsty, cankered, goblin-ridden, she clung about her sister, kissed and kissed and kissed her. Tears once again refreshed her sunken eyes, dropping like rain after long, sultry drouth. Shaking with anguish, fear, and pain, she kissed and kissed with her hungry mouth. Her lips began to scorch that juice was warm to her tongue. She loathed the feast, writhing as one possessed, she leaped and sung, rent all her robe and wrung her hands in a lamentable haste, and beat her breast, her locks streamed like the torch borne by a racer at full speed, or like the mane of horses in their flight, or like an eagle when she stems the light, straight towards the sun, or like a cage thing freed, or like a flying flag when armies run. Swift fire spread through her veins, knocked at her heart, met the fire smoldering there, and overboard its lesser flame. She gorged on bitterness without a name. Ah, fool to choose such part of soul-consuming care. Sense failed in the mortal strife, like the watchtower of a town which an earthquake shatters down, like a lightning-stricken mass, like a wind-uprooted tree spun about, like a foam-topped water spout, cast down headlong in the sea. She fell at last. Pleasure passed and anguish passed. Is it death or is it life? Life out of death. That night long Lizzie watched by her, counted her pulses flagging stir, felt for her breath, held water to her lips and cooled her face with tears and fanning leaves. 
but when the first birds chirped about their eaves and early reapers plodded to the place of golden sheaves and dew-wet grass bowed in the morning wind so brisk to pass and new buds with new day opened of cup like lilies on the stream laura awoke as from a dream laughed in the innocent old way hugged lizzie but not twice or thrice her gleaming locks showed not one thread of grey, her breath was sweet as May, and light danced in her eyes. Days, weeks, months, years, afterwards when both were wives with children of their own, their mother hearts besets with fear, their lives bound up in tender lives. Laura would call the little ones and tell them of her early prime, those pleasant days long gone of not returning time, would talk about the haunted glen, the wicked, quaint, fruit merchant men, their fruits like honey to the throat, but poison in the blood men sell not such in any town but tell them how her sister stood in deadly peril to do her good and win the fiery antidote then joining hands to little hands would bid them cling together for there is no friend like a sister in calm or stormy weather to cheer one on the tedious way to fetch one if one goes astray to lift one if one totters down to strengthen whilst one stands end of poem this recording is in the public domain Her Eyelash by Maurice Keesing, read for LibriVox.org by Rapunzelina. You beg me to write on your eyelash a sonnet. I'm thankful tis not to describe a new bonnet. So I hastened with pleasure your wish to fulfil, for where there's a way, there should e'er be a will. At least I have twisted the proverb a bit, which blame to my dullness and not to my wit. I shall fancy your eyelash as black as is coal, for the acme of beauty this is in the east. But your bright eyes are glancing right into my soul, and I still must digress for a moment at least. Then the eyelash is fringy and silky and long. I've been told these three signs always indicate beauty, but that smile so bewitching is leading me wrong, and I fear once again I'm forgetting my duty. The eyelash, you say, is your sole fascination, but I must demur to the strange imputation. Ah, that blush on your cheek says you're only pretending. How sweet the red bloom looks, it seems never-ending. To return to the eyelash, I'm sadly neglectful. I wished to describe it, sincerely I did, but I fear I'm unable, though very regretful, in this little instance to do as I'm bid such distracting attractions i cannot be missing for now i'm regarding the sweet cherry lips if you've no objection i'd rather be kissing than writing inaptly and making such slips end of poem this recording is in the public domain the highwayman by alfred noyes read for librivox.org by jonah oclani part one the wind was a torrent of darkness among the gusty trees the moon was a ghostly galleon tossed upon cloudy seas the road was a ribbon of moonlight over the purple moor and the highwayman came riding 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 the highwayman came riding up to the old inn door he'd a french cocked hat on his forehead a bunch of lace at his chin a coat of the claret velvet and breeches of brown doe skin they fitted with never a wrinkle, his boots were up to the thigh, and he rode with a jewelled twinkle, his pistol butts a twinkle, his rapier hilt a twinkle, under the jewelled sky. Over the cobbles he clattered and clashed in the dark inn yard, he tapped with his whip on the shutters, but all was locked and barred. He whistled a tune to the window, and who should be waiting there but the landlord's black-eyed daughter? Bess, the landlord's daughter plaiting a dark red love-knot into her long black hair. And dark in the dark old inn-yard a stable wicked creaked, where Tom the ostler listened, his face was white and peaked. His eyes were hollows of madness, his hair like mouldy hay, but he loved the landlord's daughter, the landlord's red-lipped daughter. Dumb as a dog he listened, and he heard the robbers say, one kiss, my bonny sweetheart, I'm after a prize to-night, but I shall be back with the yellow gold before the morning light. Yet, if they press me sharply and harrow me through the day, then look for me by moonlight, 
watch for me by moonlight. I'll come to thee by moonlight, though hell should bar the way. He rose upright in the stirrups. He scarce could reach her hand, but she loosened her hair in the casement, his face burnt like a brand, as the black cascade of perfume came tumbling over his breast, and he kissed its waves in the moonlight. Oh, sweet black waves in the moonlight! Then he tugged at his rein in the moonlight, and galloped away to the west. Part Two He did not come in the dawning, he did not come at noon and out of the tawny sunset before the rise of the moon, when the road was a gypsy's ribbon, looping the purple moor, a red-coat troop came marching, marching, marching. King George's men came marching up to the old inn door. They said no word to the landlord, they drank his ale instead, but they gagged his daughter and bound her to the foot of her narrow bed. Two of them knelt at her casement with muskets at their side. There was death, at every window, and hell at one dark window, for Bess could see through her casement the road that he would ride. They had tied her up to attention, with many a sniggering jest, they had bound a musket beside her, with the muzzle beneath her breast. Now keep watch, and they kissed her. She heard the doomed man say, Look for me by moonlight, watch for me by moonlight, I'll come to thee by moonlight though hell should bar the way. She twisted her hands behind her, but all the knots held good. She writhed her hands till her fingers were wet with sweat or blood. They stretched and strained in the darkness, and the hours crawled by like years, till, now, on the stroke of midnight, cold on the stroke of midnight, the tip of one finger touched it. The trigger, at least, was hers. The tip of one finger touched it, she strove no more for the rest. Up, she stood up to attention, with the muzzle beneath her breast. She would not risk their hearing, she would not strive again, for the road lay bare in the moonlight, blank and bare in the moonlight, and the blood of her veins in the moonlight throbbed to her love's refrain. Tlot, 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 had they heard it? The horse hoofs ringing clear, tlot, 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 tlot. In the distance, were they deaf that they did not hear? Down the ribbon of moonlight, over the brow of the hill, the highwayman came riding, riding, riding. The red coats looked to their priming. She stood up, straight and still. Tlot, tlot in the frosty silence, tlot, tlot in the echoing night. Nearer he came and nearer, her face was like a light. Her eyes grew wide for a moment. She drew one last deep breath and her finger moved in the moonlight. Her musket shattered the moonlight, shattered her breast in the moonlight, and warned him with her death. He turned, he spurred to the west, he did not know who stood, bowed with her head over the musket, drenched with her own blood. Not till the dawn he heard it, and his face grew gray to hear how Bess, the landlord's daughter, the landlord's black-eyed daughter, had watched for her love in the moonlight, and died in the darkness there. Back he spurred like a madman, shrieking a curse to the sky, with the white road smoking behind him and his rapier brandished high. Blood red were his spurs in the golden noon, wine red was his velvet coat, when they shot him down on the highway, down like a dog on the highway, and he lay in his blood on the highway with a bunch of lace at his throat. And still of a winter's night, they say, when the wind is in the trees, when the moon is a ghostly galleon tossed upon cloudy seas, when the road is a ribbon of moonlight over the purple moor, a highwayman comes riding, riding, riding. A highwayman comes riding up to the old inn door. Over the cobbles he clatters and clangs in the darkened yard. He taps with his whip on the shutters, but all is locked and barred. He whistles a tune to the window, and who should be waiting there but the landlord's black-eyed daughter, Bess, the landlord's daughter, plaiting a dark red love knot into her long black hair. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Hope is the Thing with Feathers by Emily Dickinson Read for LibraryVox.org by Jonah O'Clani 
Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul, and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard, and sore must be the storm that could abash the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea, yet never in extremity it asked a crumb of me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Human Seasons by John Keats Read for LibriVox.org by M. Lee Four seasons fill the measure of the year. There are four seasons in the mind of man. He has his lusty spring when fancy clear takes in all beauty with an easy span. He has his summer when luxuriously spring's honeyed cud of youthful thought he loves to ruminate and by such dreaming high is nearest unto heaven quiet coves his soul has in its autumn when his wings he furleth close contented so to look on mists in idleness to let fair things pass by unheeded as a threshold brook he has his winter too of pale misfeature or else he would forego his mortal nature End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. In Flanders Fields by John McRae Read for LibriVox.org by Roger Smith In Flanders Fields In Flanders Fields the poppies blow Between the crosses row on row that mark our place and in the sky the larks still bravely singing fly scarce heard amid the guns below we are the dead short days ago we lived felt dawn saw sunset glow loved and were loved and now we lie in flanders fields take up our quarrel with the foe to you from failing hands we throw the torch be yours to hold it high if ye break faith with us who die we shall not sleep Though poppies grow in Flanders fields. End of recording. This recording is in the public domain. Isis by Hugh McCulloch. Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist. No fear is in those eyes, no love, no hate, nor aught of mortal nor have men a name for her emotions wherein pride and shame are known as slightly as men know their fate in awful calm the end she doth await ten thousand years ago all mortals came unto her image with supreme acclaim she doth not care that worshippers abate now men affirm of her that she is not yet when no word of man can be forgot, but ever liveth, thrilling through the airs, when not a deed of man but bears its fruit, can speaking lips be barren as though mute? Might not a goddess spring from many prayers? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Journey of the Magi by T. S. Eliot Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp A cold coming we had of it, just the worst time of the year for a journey, and such a long journey, the ways deep and the weather sharp, the very dead of winter, and the camels galled, sore-footed, refractory, lying down in the melting snow. There were times we regretted the summer palaces on slopes, the terraces, and the silken girls bringing sherbet. Then the camel men, cursing and grumbling and running away, and wanting their liquor and women, and the night fires going out, and the lack of shelters, and the cities hostile, and the towns unfriendly, and the villages dirty and charging high prices. A hard time we had of it. At the end we preferred to travel all night, sleeping in snatches, 
with the voices singing in our ears, saying that this was all folly. Then at dawn we came down to a temperate valley, wet below the snow line, smelling of vegetation, with a running stream and a water mill beating the darkness, and three trees on the low sky. And an old white horse galloped away in the meadow. Then we came to a tavern with vine leaves over the lintel, six hands at an open door dicing for pieces of silver, and feet kicking the empty wine skins. But there was no information, and so we continued, and arrived at evening, not a moment too soon, finding the place, it was, you may say, satisfactory. All this was a long time ago, I remember, and I would do it again, but set down this, set down this. Were we led all that way for birth or death? There was a birth, certainly. We had evidence, and no doubt. I had seen birth and death, but had thought they were different. This birth was hard and bitter agony for us, like death, our death. We returned to our places, these kingdoms, but no longer at ease here in the old dispensation with an alien people clutching their gods. I should be glad of another death. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Looking Upon Jesus As He Walked by Michael Field Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson What is it thou hast seen, O desert prophet, hung with camel's hair and lean? What makes thine eyes so wide? Not the huge desert where the camel owners ride, But one who comes along so humble in his step, And yet to him belong thy days in their surcease, Because he must increase as thou must now decrease. Behold thy God, whose strength is as the coiling in of thy life's length, Thou of wide eyes, wide soul, thy heart blood as he comes to thee, He's on its goal. Saint of the sinner, John, Those whom thy lustral water hath been poured upon, Those who have kept thy fast, With locusts and wild honey, And long hours have passed in penance, When they see Christ coming toward them, Young and fair, with what shall be, And giving God delight, They know by very doom of that remorseless sight, That they as they have been, will fade away, diminish, and no more be seen. They must, O oh desert saint, bow them to certain death, and yet they must not faint, and yet they must proclaim the obliterating flourish of their slayer's name. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Martyrdom of Father Campion by Henry Walpole Read for LibriVox.org by Paula Messina England, look up! Thy soil is stained with blood. Thou hast made martyrs many of thine own. If thou hadst grace, their deaths would do thee good. The seed will take, which in such blood is sown and Campion's learning fertile so before, thus water too, must needs of force be more. All Europe wonders at so rare a man. England is filled with rumor of his end. London must needs, for it was present then when constantly three saints their lives did spend. The streets, the stones, the steps, they held them by, proclaim the cause, for which these martyrs die. The tower says the truth he did defend, the bar bears witness of his guiltless mind. Tyburn doth tell he made a patient end. In every gate his martyrdom we find. In vain you wrought that would obscure his name, for heaven and earth will still record the same. His quartered limbs shall join with joy again, and rise a body brighter than the sun. 
your bloody malice tormented him in vain. For every wrench some glory hath him won, and every drop of blood which he did spend hath reaped a joy which never shall have end. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Moonrise by Hugh McCulloch Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist When Adam on his first terrestrial day Beheld the dark devouring shades of night descend And hide the garden from his sight He prostrate fell and trembling strove to pray He pressed his forehead deep into the clay He hearkened to earth's travail with affright he strove to still his breathing, lest it might enrage the thing that drove the light away. But when, as born upon the night air's breath, a light shone, and the east therewith was dyed to silver, Adam rose, and saw the wide moon hurrying on as one that hasteneth. Then was his heart released from fear of death, and all the waiting world was glorified. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Mutability by William Wordsworth Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk from low to high doth dissolution climb and sink from high to low along a scale of awful notes whose concord shall not fail a musical but melancholy chime which they can hear who meddle not with crime nor avarice nor over anxious care truth fails not but her outward forms that bear the longest date do melt like frosty rhyme that in the morning whitened hill and plain and is no more drop like the tower sublime of yesterday which royally did wear his crown of weeds but could not even sustain some casual shout that broke the silent air or the unimaginable touch of time end of poem this recording is in the public domain. My Dear and Only Love by James Graham Read for LibriVox.org by Public Domain Scholar My dear and only love, I pray, This noble world of thee be governed By no other sway but purest monarchy. For if confusion have a part, which virtuous souls abhor, and hold a synod in thy heart, I'll never love thee more. Like Alexander, I will reign, and I will reign alone. My thoughts shall evermore disdain a rival on my throne. He either fears his fate too much, or his deserts are small, that puts it not unto the touch, to win or lose it all. But I must rule and govern still, and always give the law, and have each subject at my will, and all to stand in all. But against my battery, if I find thou shunst the prize so sore, as that thou settest me up a blind, I'll never love thee more. Or in the empire of thy heart, where I should solely be, another do pretend to part, and dares to view with me. Or if committees thou erect, and go on such a score, I'll sing and laugh at thy neglect, and never love thee more. But if thou wilt be constant then, and faithful of thy word, I'll make thee glorious by my pen, and famous by my sword. I'll serve thee in such noble ways, was never heard before. I'll crown and deck thee, all with bays, and love thee evermore. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. My Star by Robert Browning Read for LibriVox.org by Roger Smith My Star All that I know of a certain star is it can throw 
like the angled spar. Now a dart of red, now a dart of blue, till my friends have said they would fain see two, my star that dartles the red and the blue. Then it stops like a bird, like a flower hangs furled. They must solace themselves with the Saturn above it. What matter to me if their star is a world? Mine has opened its soul to me, therefore I love it. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. No Room in the Inn by Jerry Miles Humphrey Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson No room in the inn for the holy child Who descended to earth so meek and mild. But out in the manger with bleating sheep The Lord of glory in swaddling doth sleep. No room in the inn for the man of grief who suffered all things to bring us relief, that every creature, both great and small, might be unshackled from Apollyon's thrall. No room in the inn for the Lamb of God, who came to earth only to shed his blood on Calvary's cruel and rugged cross, that sinful rebels might never be lost. No room in the inn for Prince of Life, who came from the Father to quell the strife, to take from the graveyard the victory and set all its slumbering prisoners free. No room in the inn for the balm of old, whose touch makes the sick and the suffering whole. His blood floweth out in an endless stream, calling all nations to wash and be clean. No room in the inn for the sacred groom, who's fairer than all the lilies in bloom. He's sweeter than Sharon's beautiful rose, and it scatters a sunshine wherever he goes. No room in the inn for the king of kings, the lord of glory where purity reigned, whose home was garnished with jasper and gold, and fadeless flowers that never grow old. No room in the inn of our hearts and love, no room for the sacred heavenly dove, no room in our lives for the Saviour's praise, but constant rejection in all our ways. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. An Ode on the Death of Mr. Henry Purcell, late servant to His Majesty and organist of the Chapel Royal and of St. Peter's Westminster, by John Dryden, read for LibriVox.org, by Alan Mapstone. Mark how the lark and linnet sing, with rival notes they strain their warbling throats to welcome in the spring but in the close of night when philomel begins her heavenly lay they cease their mutual spite drink in her music with delight and listening and silent and silent and listening and listening and silent obey so ceased the rival crew when purcell came they sung no more, or only sung his fame. Struck dumb, they all admired the godlike man, the godlike man, alas, too soon retired, as he too late began. We beg not hell our Orpheus to restore. Had he been there, their sovereign's fear had sent him back before the power of harmony too well they know he long ere this had tuned their jarring sphere and left no hell below the heavenly choir who heard his notes from high let down the scale of music from the sky they handed him along and all the way he taught and all the way they sung ye brethren of the lyre and tuneful voice lament his lot but at your own rejoice now live secure and linger out your days the gods are pleased alone with purcell's lays nor know to mend their choice end of poem this recording is in the public domain On Canton Road by Samuel M. Sargent, Jr. 
Read for LibriVox.org by Dale Grothman. The ancient house on Canton Road is bleak and blank and lone. Its windows stare with stolid eyes over its walls of stone. Its windows stare with stolid eyes, but window eyes are blind. Its windows are like midnight lakes, deep frozen in the wind. Its stoop is dank, of prison stone, if prison stone be cold. Its stoop is dank, and creepers crawl over it, fold on fold. It has a yard of fetid vines that straggle to the wall. It has a tree, one weary tree, waiting long to fall. The trunk is green with viscid growth. The wall, the house are green. And at the windows of a night, the creeper's souls are seen. But souls of things are better hid, That fiends gaze on with lust. The vines, like millipedes, squirm up, House high above the dust. The vines, like sticks-fed tarns, Edge upward to the night. Hell-grown mosses choke the house, For houses do not fight. Hell-grown mosses writhe and twist On wall, on house, on tree. Tis better not to see the souls Of things men should not see. The ancient house on Canton Road Is bleak and blank and green, And fill me with a thousand things That better are not seen. End of poem. This poem is in the public domain. Out in the Fields by Unknown. Read for LibriVox.org by Ike Scher. The little cares that fretted me, I lost them yesterday. Among the fields above the sea, among the winds at play, Among the lowing of the herds, The rustling of the trees, Among the singing of the birds, The humming of the bees. The foolish fears of what might pass, I cast them all away, Among tile clover scented grass, Among new mown hay, Among the hushing of the corn, Where drowsy poppies nod, where ill thoughts die, and good are born. Out in the fields of God. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Psalm of Life. What the Heart of the Young Man Said to the Psalmist. By Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Read for LibriVox.org by Scott Payne Tell me not, in mournful numbers, life is but an empty dream, for the soul is dead that slumbers, and things are not what they seem. Life is real, life is earnest, and the grave is not its goal. Dust thou art, to dust returnest, was not spoken of the soul. Not enjoyment, and not sorrow, is our destined end or way, but to act that each tomorrow find us farther than today. Art is long, and time is fleeting, and our hearts, though stout and brave, still, like muffled drums, are beating funeral marches to the grave. In the world's broad field of battle, in the bivouac of life, be not like dumb-driven cattle, be a hero in the strife. Trust no future, howe'er pleasant, let the dead past bury its dead. Act, act in the living present, heart within and God o'erhead. Lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime, and, 
departing, leave behind us, footprints on the sands of time. Footprints that perhaps another, sailing o'er life's solemn main, a forlorn and shipwrecked brother, seeing, shall take heart again. Let us then be up and doing, with a heart for any fate, still achieving, still pursuing, learn to labour and to wait. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Shropshire Lad, Poem 32, by A. E. Houseman. Read for LibriVox.org by Wyatt Anderson. From far from eve and morning, and yon twelve winded sky, the stuff of life to knit me blew hither, here am I. Now for a breath I tarry, nor yet disperse apart. Take my hand quick and tell me. What have you in your heart? Speak now, and I will answer. How shall I help you say? Ere to the wind's twelve quarters, I take my endless way. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Song by Thomas Babington Macaulay Read for LibriVox.org by Ananda Samudra. O oh, stay, Madonna, stay. Tis not the dawn of day that marks the skies with yonder opal streak. The stars in silence shine, then press thy lips to mine and rest upon my neck, thy fervid cheek. O oh, sleep, Madonna, sleep. Leave me to watch and weep over the sad memory of departed joys, over hope's extinguished beam, over fancy's vanished dream, over all that nature gives and man destroys. O oh, wake, Madonna, wake, even now the purple lake is dappled over Amber flakes of light, a glow is on the hill, and every trickling rill in golden threads leaps down from yonder height. O oh, fly, Madonna, fly, lest day and envy spy what holy love and night may safely know. Fly, and tread softly, dear, lest those who hate us hear. The sounds of thy light's footsteps as they go. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Song, oh, I Love the Jock and Dance by William Blake. Read for LibriVox.org by Ronald Gardella. I love the jock and dance, the softly breathing song, where innocent eyes do glance, and where lifts the maiden's tongue. I love the laughing veil. I love the echoing hill, where mirth does never fail, and the jolly swain laughs his fill. I love the pleasant cot, I love the innocent bower, where white and brown is our lot, or fruit in the midday hour. I love the oaken seat, beneath the oaken tree, where all the old villagers meet, and laugh our sports to see. I love our neighbors all, but Kitty, I better love thee, and love them I ever shall. But thou art all to me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Song, Memory Come Hither by William Blake. Read for LibriVox.org by Ronald Gardella. Memory, come hither and tune your merry notes. And while upon the wind your music floats, I'll pour upon the stream or sign lovers dream, and fish for fancies as they pass within the watery glass. I'll drink of the clear stream, and hear the linnet song, and there I'll lie and dream the day along, and when night comes, I'll go to places fit for woe, walking along the darkened valley, with silent melancholy. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
the story of augustus who would not have any soup by heinrich hoffman read for librivox dot org by m lee augustus was a chubby lad fat ruddy cheeks augustus had and everybody saw with joy the plump and hearty healthy boy he ate and drank as he was told and never let his soup get cold but one day one cold winter's day he screamed out take the soup away oh take the nasty soup away i won't have any soup to-day next day begins his tale of woes quite lank and lean augustus grows yet though he feels so weak and ill the naughty fellow cries out still not any soup for me i say oh take the nasty soup away i won't have any soup to-day the third day comes oh what a sin to make himself so pale and thin yet when the soup is put on table he screams as loud as he is able not any soup for me i say oh take the nasty soup away i won't have any soup to-day look at him now the fourth day's come he scarcely weighs a sugar plum he's like a little bit of thread and on the fifth day he was dead end of poem this recording is in the public domain there is no life or death by mina loy read for librivox dot org by winston tharp there is no life or death only activity and in the absolute is no declivity there is no love or lust only propensity who would possess is a non-entity there is no first or last only equality and who would rule joins the majority there is no space or time only intensity and tame things have no immensity end of poem this recording is in the public domain to anthea who may command him anything by alfred cotrain read for librivox dot org by ike Scher. new style am i sincere i say i dote on everything that browning wrote i know some bits by heart to quote but then she reads them i say and is it strictly true how i admire her cockatoo well in a way of course i do but then she feeds him and i become at her command the sternest tory in the land the grand old man is far from grand but then she states it nay worse than that i'm so tame i once admitted to my shame that football was a brutal game because she hates it my taste in art she hailed with groans and i once charmed with bolder tones now love the yellows of burne jones but then she likes them my tuneful soul no longer hoards stray jewels from the empire boards i revel now in dvorak's chords but then she strikes them our age distinctly cramped to night yet though debarred from tilt and fight i can admit that black is white if she asserts it heroes of old were luckier men than i i venture now and then to hint retracting meekly when she controverts it end of poem this recording is in the public domain To the Muses by William Blake, read for LibriVox.org by Ronald Gardella. Whether on Ida's shadowy brow or in the chambers of the east, the chambers of the sun, that now from ancient melody have ceased, 
whether in heaven ye wander fair or the green corners of the earth or the blue regions of the air where the melodious winds have birth, whether on crystal rocks ye rove beneath the bosom of the sea, wandering in many a coral grove, fair nine, forsaking poetry. How have you left the ancient love that bards of old enjoyed in you? The languid strings do scarcely move, the sound is forced, the notes are few. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To a Snowflake by Francis Thompson Read for LibriVox.org by Ike Scher What heart could have thought you? Past our devisal, O oh, filigree petal, Fashioned so purely, fragilely, surely, From what paradisal, imagineless metal, Too costly for cost? Who hammered you, wrought you, from Argentine vapour. God was my shaper. Passing surmisal he hammered. He wrought me from curled silver vapour to lust of his mind. Thou couldst not have thought me so purely, so palely, tinily, surely, mightily, fraily, in sculpt and embossed with his hammer of wind and his graver of frost. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Twas the Night Before Christmas, A Visit from St. Nicholas by Clement Clark Moore Read for LibriVox.org by Aaron Sproul "'Twas the night before Christmas, and all through the house "'not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. "'The stockings were hung by the chimney with care, "'in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. "'The children were nestled all snug in their beds, "'while visions of sugar-plums danced in their heads, "'and Mama in her kerchief, and I in my cap, "'had just settled our brains for a long winter's nap. "'When out on the lawn there arose such a clatter, I sprang from the bed to see what was the matter. Away to the window I flew like a flash, tore open the shutters and threw up the sash. The moon on the breast of the new-fallen snow gave the luster of midday to objects below, when what to my wondering eye should appear but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer. With a little old driver so lively and quick, I knew in a moment it must be St. Nick. More rapid than eagles his courses they came, and he whistled and shouted and called them by name. Now Dasher, now Dancer, now Prancer and Vixen, on Comet, on Cupid, on Donder and Blitzen, to the top of the porch, to the top of the wall, now dash away, dash away, dash away all! As dry leaves that before the wild hurricane fly, when they met with an obstacle, mount to the sky, so up to the housetop the courses they flew, with a sleigh full of toys, and St. Nicholas too. And then, in a twinkling, I heard on the roof the prancing and pawing of each little hoof. As I drew in my head and was turning around, down the chimney St. Nicholas came with a bound. He was dressed all in fur from his head to his foot, and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot. A bundle of toys he had flung on his back, and he looked like a peddler just opening his pack. His eyes how they twinkled, his dimples how merry, his cheeks were like roses, his nose like a cherry, his droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow, and the beard of his chin was as white as the snow. The stump of a pipe he held tight in his teeth, and the smoke it encircled his head like a wreath. He had a broad face and a little round belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf, and I laughed when I saw him in spite of myself. A wink of his eye and a twist of his head soon gave me to know I had nothing to dread. He spoke not a word, but went straight to his work, and filled all the stockings, and turned with a jerk, and laying his finger aside of his nose, and giving a nod, up the chimney he rose. He sprang to his sleigh, to his team gave a whistle, and away they all flew like the down of a thistle. But I heard him exclaim, ere he drove out of sight, Happy Christmas to all, and to all a good night. End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Upon the Image of Death by Robert Southwell Read for LibriVox.org by Paula Messina Before my face the picture hangs 
the daily should put me in mind of those cold names and bitter pangs that shortly I am like to find. But yet, alas, full little I do think hereon that I must die. I often look upon a face most ugly, grisly, bare, and thin. I often view the hollow place where eyes and nose had sometimes been. I see the bones across that lie, yet little think that I must die. I read the label underneath that telleth me whereto I must. I see the sentence eke that saith, Remember, man, that thou art dust. But yet, alas, but seldom I do think indeed that I must die. Continually at my bed's head a hearse doth hang, which doth tell me that I ere morning may be dead, though now I feel myself full well. But yet, alas, for all this, I have little mind that I must die. The gown which I do use to wear, the knife wherewith I cut my meat, and eke that old and ancient chair which is my only usual seat. All these do tell me I must die, and yet my life amend not I. My ancestors are turned to clay, and many of my mates are gone. My youngers daily drop away, and can I think to scape alone? No, no, I know that I must die, and yet my life amend not I. Not Solomon for all his wit, nor Samson, though he were so strong, no king nor person ever yet could scape but death laid him along. Wherefore I know that I must die, and yet my life amend not I. Though all the East did quake to hear of Alexander's dreadful name, and all the West did likewise fear to hear of Julius Caesar's fame, yet both by death and dust now lie. Who then can scape, but he must die? If none can scape death's dreadful dart, if rich and poor his beck obey, if strong, if wise, if all do smart, then I to scape shall have no way. O oh, grant me grace, O oh God, that I my life may mend, sith I must die. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Wind That Shakes the Barley by Robert Dwyer Joyce Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone I sat within the valley green, I sat me with my true love, My sad heart strove the two between, The old love and the new love the old for her the new that made me think on ireland dearly while soft the wind blew down the glade and shook the golden barley twas hard the woeful words to frame to break the ties that bound us Twas harder still to bear the shame of foreign chains around us. And so I said, the mountain glen I'll seek at morning early, and join the brave united men while soft winds shook the barley while sad i kissed away her tears my fond arms round her flinging the foeman's shock burst on our ears from out the wild wood ringing the bullet pierced my true love's side in life's young spring so early 
and on my breast in blood she died when soft winds shook the barley but blood for blood without remorse i've ta'en at oulard hollow i've placed my true love's clay-cold course where i full soon shall follow and round her grave i wander drear noon night and morning early with breaking heart whene'er i hear the wind that shakes the barley end of poem this recording is in the public domain the year's end by timothy cole read for librivox dot org by m lee full happy is the man who comes at last into the safe completion of his year weathered the perils of his spring that blast how many blossoms promising and dear and of his summer with dread passions fraught that oft like fire through the ripening corn blight all with mocking death and leave distraught loved ones to mourn the ruined waste forlorn but now though autumn gave but harvest slight o oh, grateful is he to the powers above for winter's sunshine and the lengthened night by hearthside genial with the warmth of love through silvered days of vistas golden green contentedly he glides away serene End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.